going to take the first uh, session.
Okay. Test it. Hello. Can you hear me, Sam? You want me to try? No, not yet. All right. Yes, Robin needs one. As they're coming in, we're giving them out. Could just put them at the seats. started. I know we've got some people watching on streaming as well, so if you say anything, just know it might be going all over the world. Um, let's stand up for just a moment. Sit down, stand up. Church aerobics. <laughs> just think, yeah, you're not having a meal. <laughs> Take somebody by the hand real quick, and because uh, people come in tonight with all kind of uh, stuff from the day. So, Father, just pray for the person beside you to your left and to your right. Father, we want to thank you that tonight, not only those that are in the room, but those who are watching by live streaming, we bless in the name of Jesus and the resurrected glory in which he dwells. Father, we're asking that all the heaviness, all the, uh, the stuff that people may have brought in here tonight would just be washed away. Um, by the revelation of your great love. Father, we pray that our eyes would be open, that we would hear, that we would sense, and in our hearts that we would perceive the glory of who you are and who we are in you. Change our perspectives and align our hearts tonight. We bless Trisha as she brings the first session, and I bless myself as I bring the se second one in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. You guys can be seated. Thank you for being a part of Grace Revolution School of Ministry. And uh, we're doing this free class tonight. Uh, as uh, last year we uh, made this, this is kind of, I think, part three. Foundations of the Gospel is first. The second one is communion with God's heart. And it is about um, hearing God's voice. And this one is really about getting our hearts lined up for God to be able to do some stuff in our lives. So I give you the beautiful uh, Pastor Tricia who will take it over from here. Thank you. Hello, everybody. As you come in, grab a, a syllabus. We won't go over all of this, but a couple of things on there I want to go over with you. We don't have books for you to purchase this week. We'll try to get some in. But these are a couple of the books that we're going to be referring to a good bit. How many of you already have these or one of these? So these, you can, you can get them on Amazon. You can load them down to your Kindle. Um, Wired for Success, Program for Failure, or Becoming the Person You Want to Be, Jim Richards. These are great books. I encourage you to get them, read them. They're going to make your uh, life better. So get them. Get the Wired for Success one. Um, there's free stuff on his website. It takes about five hours to do it for free. Okay. So right now, Jim is offering on his website free video if you get the Wired for Success from his website. And his website is Impact Ministries. Oh, no, no, no. You don't even have to buy the book from his website. Because I bought the book here. But when you go to Impact Ministries, you get it. Okay. Because, like, the secret word is in the book. <laughs> 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 but you got to read the book to get the secret word, to put it into the yes. website to get the material. But it's worth it. Read the book. Um, so it's impactministries.org, right? Dot com. Impactministries.com. All right, so this is called Aligning Your Heart for Destiny. This is one of the Grace Revolution School of Ministry classes. If you are taking this for credit as part of the college, you do have a final on here. So you always get your homework. You always get your final. Check that out on your syllabus. Uh, we will have some homework that we're going to encourage everybody to do, whether you're taking this for credit or not, and I'll pass that out at the end of class. So we won't read down the syllabus, just, but just to um, be aware that that's there. This is what the class is about. Um, we want you to be able to learn to steward your heart, to manage your heart, to focus effectively communing with God. And we're going to cover a bunch of ways that you can do that. 
So the first thing we're going to talk about is John 9:41. It's Jesus talking, and he said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But you say, We see. Therefore, your sin remains. They were blind because they think they see. If we think we see something already, we are blind to the options that are around us. So think about that statement. It's kind of like you can't see the forest for the trees. You're in the midst of it and you can't see it. When we enter, when we enter into anything thinking we already have all the answers and all the knowledge that we need, we just blinded ourselves. So when you begin this class, I want you to lay aside the knowledge that you feel like you already have and um, begin to listen to the Holy Spirit and see what he's going to say to you. Be willing to open your heart, open your spirit to what Holy Spirit's going to say to you so that that filter that you usually see through doesn't cloud or distort what he's trying to say to you because he's got something to speak to every one of us. If you want to change, you've got to be willing to apply what you've learned. If you just listen and you don't do anything with it, it's not going to do you much good. You can walk away with pages and pages of notes, but if you don't apply them or do anything to them, you're just going to have attended another self-help seminar and your notes will get stuck on a bookshelf and collect dust and that's about as far as it'll go. So you have to apply what you're learning. And so we're learning in this class how to align your heart for the destiny God has for you. So we're going to start with some definitions. Grace, because we want to filter everything we do through the eyes of grace. God's power, capacity, and ability, which comes through unmerited favor and works from the heart. That's God's grace. So we want to define the heart. It's the real me, the place of self-identity. It's the seat of your emotions. It's the seat of feelings, both good and bad. It's the core of your understanding, the place where your will and your intentions are. It's the part of you that believes. So the heart seeks to preserve your true identity and who you are in Christ. And it's the place where I seek and commune with God. That's my heart. So a healthy heart equals a healthy body. So we want our hearts to be healthy. And we do that by aligning them with the word and with who we are in Christ. So align is, the definition of align is to bring something into line. Very simple, huh? To place something in a straight line or in an orderly position in relation to something else. To be placed in this way to bring or come into correct position. And that's our goal in this class is to get our hearts into the correct position so that we understand uh, our destiny. So what is destiny? It is an inner realizable purpose of life. The inner purpose of life that can be discovered and realized. So when you say, I don't have a destiny, I don't know what I'm doing, I don't know where I'm going, it can be. It is achievable. You can discover, you can realize your destiny, and you can achieve it. So the purpose of this heart is, this class is to get our hearts so free that it lines up with the heart of God so that you can fulfill the destiny that God has for you. And we'll spend a lot of time talking about the heart. We'll spend a lot of time talking about how to align it so we can see our destiny with certainty. We'll talk a lot about the heart and the way we'll deal with issues that are in our hearts and how to do all of this while keeping our eyes on Jesus and who we are because of what he did. Because who we are is because of what he did, right? Who we are in Christ. So we're going to start with talking about the heart. Every organ in your body has a frequency. And the frequency of your heart is 5,000 times stronger than that of your mind. So if you think about that, if something is 5,000 times bigger than me, okay, if, if there's somebody standing next to me and they're five times bigger, that's pretty big. 50 times bigger is pretty big. 500 times, that's pretty big. 5,000 times, you can't even see the top. So that's pretty big difference. Your heart frequency is 5,000 times stronger than your mind. So that means that we function out of what our hearts believe. What our minds believe is what we think, that, that's what we think we function out of. But we really function out of what our heart believes. Because your intellect is going to say, well, you believe this, so this must be what you're doing. 
But if that was the case, we wouldn't be running around the same mountain over and over and over and then go, why do I keep doing this? Why do I have the same problem over and over and over? It's because our heart is directing our behavior. And um, you have to, it's, it's kind of like if you say, is it hot in here to y'all? I'm seeing fanning in here. Yes, okay. <laughs> Somebody's going to take care of the thermostat because the heat's probably on. Um, okay, so if you were, if you believe, I, and you keep saying, I'm never going to rise above poverty, but your mind knows I can, but you just keep saying I'll never will, chances are you never will, and you're going to stay in that same place your whole life because that's what your heart believes. Your heart believes I won't, even though your head says I will. So why is this? Why do we do what we don't want to do? Right? <laughs> Because we've trained ourselves not to notice our feelings and emotions. We've trained ourselves not to notice our feelings and emotions. And then in order to connect with our heart and hear God speak, we have to retrain ourselves to notice what we're feeling. We've been trained not to notice our feelings or emotions, but we have to retrain ourselves to notice them. We've been taught if a feeling comes up, you just squish it down and don't, don't acknowledge it, just ignore it, it'll go away, right? It doesn't just go away, it stays there and eventually it's gonna come back because, and those feelings are gonna lead to behaviors. So there is a window of opportunity to stop a negative feeling when it comes up that we have to learn to take advantage of and deal with that feeling. And we deal with that by transforming our beliefs. It's not behavior modification. If you do get into behavior modification, that's when the boyfriend says, I'll change. Yeah, you'll change as long as I, the girl is right there and as soon as she's gone, you're back to the way you were. That's not true transformation. <laughs> so what we're talking about is transforming our beliefs to line up with believing who we are in Christ. So when a feeling came, comes up, notice it so you can address it. And what normally happens is we suppress it. We've been taught that you don't deal with your feelings or thoughts. Men especially, you've been taught you don't cry, you don't show emotion. And so you suppress, suppress, suppress. and. It's, we have to retrain ourselves to realize that it's vital to realize what our feelings are so that we can retrain ourselves to connect with our heart and to notice, to get to the truth. And this is really an attitude of repentance because repentance is changing your mind. So it's changing our mind to agree with it's okay to feel. It's okay to recognize these feelings. It's okay to uh, deal with them when they come up. It's okay to cry. How many of you were ever told just not you don't cry? Men don't cry. Or don't show emotion. Were any, anybody ever said that? Have anybody say that to you? I'll give you something to cry about. <laughs> and that wasn't the kind of crying you wanted. <laughs> yeah. So, well, crying is okay, and it is actually good for you. Tears are healing. You've heard that before, right? Well, some of the latest, I don't know how late it is, scientific uh, evidence is that every time you cry, you have a chemical makeup in your body that's different. So when you cry, your tears are of such a biochemical composition that they're designed to counteract the type of biochemical being released into your body by the type of sorrow you're having. So if I'm grieving the loss of a loved one, when I cry, my body is generating a chemical mixture of tears designed to counteract that emotion. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? <laughs> and the nurse goes, yes, she knows what it's called. <laughs> so tr here, tears truly are healing to the body. And the release that comes with crying is important. But you don't cry if you don't feel the emotion, right? You got to feel. So it's true when we, if, it, if that's true then, that we release that bad stuff every time we cry. Then if we're not crying, is it true that we're 
just filling our body full of stuff that's going to begin to cause us problems, begin to manifest. It's going to come up as sickness. It's going to come up as depression. It's going to come up as physical issues. So Luke 6.21 said, Blessed. Sometimes a really good cry is good. <laughs> Luke 6.21 Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Weeping cleanses, gets rid of the stuff, and then you're ready to laugh. How many of you have ever been at the altar and you've been ministered to, and you're just crying, 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 and then all of a sudden you just start laughing? Yeah. Yeah. Blessed are those who weep, for you shall laugh. (laughs) So hold on to that, because the laughter, laughter is medicine to you, too. So you do feel better after a good cry. It's important to feel and to deal with those feelings. Um, The beliefs are going to surface anyway, and they're going to surface in what we say. Uh, What about Proverbs 10, 11? The mouth of the righteous is a well of life. Is, Is our well of life exposed in what we're saying? Are, is it Proverbs 10, 14, the mouth of the foolish is near destruction. What you believe comes out in what you say. Proverbs 16, 24, pleasant words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the bones. We need those sweet words. We need that pleasant words, compliments. Do you feel better when somebody compliments you? Chuck is always very complimentary to me. It always boosts your self-esteem, makes you feel better when somebody compliments you. Proverbs 13, 3. He who guards his mouth preserves his life. That's pretty major, huh? Guard your mouth, preserve your life. Then Matthew 12, 34 through 35, when Jesus is speaking, he says, Brood of vipers, how can you be an evil? Speak good things, for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasures of his heart brings forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. Out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. So what's in your heart is going to come forth. So this is kind of what happens in your heart. You have these feelings come up. And beliefs are developed from feelings. Then these thoughts that are going to result in words, they're going to lead to behaviors. That's going to lead to stress. That's going to lead to sickness. So we have to start at the beginning, deal with the feelings so that we don't end up in sickness. So information plus emotion equals a belief. Information plus emotion equals belief. So if the information you got was, as you were growing up, was you're stupid, you can't do anything right, you'll never amount to anything, the emotion you may have been feeling in that was rejection, and you're going, oh, no, I am a failure. I'm not any good. And then you put those emotions of rejection with what they're saying, and it becomes a belief. Now then that person believes, I'm incapable of being successful. I'll never be more than I am now. And they may not even realize it, but that may be what keeps you stuck in a job that you can't progress beyond where you are because you don't believe you're worth it, even though you are. What about, um, I heard this most of my life, you have to work hard for everything. Nothing in life is free. You have to give it your all. Have you heard this before? The only thing in, free in life or, is breathing or something like that. Is that true? The only guarantee is death and taxes. But what else is free to us that's major? Salvation. There we go. So th- there is free stuff in life that's good. But if you were taught, nothing in life is free. Everything you get comes by hard work then what emotion would you attach with that if you're, if you're hearing that your whole life? Hopelessness. What else? Trapped. Trapped. Work-based mentality. Mm-hmm. So then what 
what belief would come out of that? Success is hard. I must work hard or I'm not successful, right? So you see how these things can really cause beliefs that we might even not even recognize are there? What about, uh, how many of you have ever known anybody in an abusive relationship and they just keep going back? So why is that? Because people that are not in that go, I just can't understand. Why would they keep going back? Why do they know what it's going to be like? But what happens in that relationship? They're told over and over, You're, you can't make it without me. You need me. You can't do it. And when you hear that day after day after day, what do you believe? What emotion is going on? What are you feeling in that? Dependence. What? Insecurity. What happens to your self-esteem? It's gone. Yeah. So then what belief comes out of that? Trapped. I'm trapped. I can't leave. What if, if I do leave, what's going to happen? And then what? I'm going to fail, and I'm going to come right back to where I was, right? And then if I leave and come back, it's going to be worse than it was, right? So you see how information plus emotion equals belief. Um, it can be something simple. Like I remember my dad talking about when I was a kid that the rich people should be taking care of the poor people. The rich people should be given to the poor. And then, uh, every, if they've got money, it's just because it was handed to them. And it, they were born with a silver spoon in their mouth. They never had to work a day for anything. Is that true? No. But then the message I received in that is, wait, rich people must be bad. There's a fear of people that have money. And there's a, a false responsibility that I'm expecting of them. I'm expecting them to do something for me that's not their responsibility. So then when you grow up, you go, well, maybe then the belief is rich people are bad. Or there's a fear of people that have money. You see how the, the two make a belief, the information plus the emotion developed a belief, and, and I had to go, that's not true. That's not true at all. And then deal with that, transform that belief, realize it's a lie, and get truth in that. So information plus emotion equals belief. And it gets in our heart, and it determines how we behave, and it determines how we live. Proverbs 15, 13 says, a merry heart makes a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. So if your heart is sorrowful, your spirit is broken. A happy heart is a cheerful countenance. So you're, the way we um, just live day to day also shows the condition of our heart. And people can see that. Proverbs 17, 22, a merry heart does good like medicine but a broken spirit dries the bones. So often people with like uh, rheumatoid arthritis, something like that, it's going to be because they have a broken spirit. Have you ever known anybody? To, can you think of anybody that had arthritis really bad and think of how their life was? Does that make sense? Hebrews 12, 15 through 16. This is the amplified version. Exercise foresight and be on the watch to look after one another, to see that no one falls back from and fails to secure God's grace, his unmerited favor and spiritual blessing, in order that no root of resentment, rancor, bitterness, or hatred shoots forth and causes trouble and bitter torment, and the many may become contaminated and defiled by it, that no one may become guilty of sexual vice or become a profane, godless, and sacrilegious person as Esau did, who sold his own birthright for a single meal. So we got to watch out from one another so that those roots of bitterness don't get in there. That's what we want to get out, is those things that are causing us problems, that uh, are beliefs that are not benefiting us. They're limiting us in our lives and what we're uh, experiencing in our Christian walk even. So it's very important to see 
what your heart believes and to transform it, to remove those limiting beliefs. So how do you do that? You gotta put off and put on. So take out a piece of paper and number it one to nine. Just in a straight row, you're just gonna write one word by each number so you won't have to have much room. And as what I'm gonna do is read a list of statements here. If I read this statement and you go, yes, I absolutely believe that, with no doubt, write yes down. If you go, nope, not true at all, or I don't think so, that's not me, or maybe for somebody else, but not for me, then you write no, okay? So yes or no, yes, I absolutely believe this is true. If you have that any little bit of, uh-uh, I don't believe it, write no, okay? So the first statement is, I want to experience greater prosperity. Number two, I am ready to experience financial abundance. Number three, I am confident in my ability to prosper. Number four, greater prosperity will make my life better. Number five, I believe success should be hard. Number six, God wants me to be prosperous. Number seven, I have the capacity to experience greater success. Number eight, I have released all fear related to prosperity. Nobody's going to see your answers, so be honest. This is, your heart knows the truth anyway. Number nine, I have released all guilt that would limit my prosperity. Number four, greater prosperity will make my life better. Anybody have any no's? <laughs> a few, yeah. So this is just a little test to show you what you really believe. If, if your heart went, uh, no, not quite, then that tells you, okay, I've got a belief. We're probably, I would say, uh, number one, I want to experience greater prosperity. Everybody probably, probably said yes on that one. But then, um, I have the capacity to experience greater success. We might have gone, mm, I'm not sure I can do that. So there's some beliefs in there, and that's just a simple test to show you how easy it is to really find out what your heart really believes. Because we want to listen to what our mind believes, because you've been taught you can do it, you can do it, and you can through Jesus. But it's changing those beliefs to where you're functioning out of your head and into your heart. So how do we change beliefs? By transformation. Transformation that causes us to walk in who we are in, tr in Christ. So how does transformation happen? Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. That you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. This is Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. Put off and put on. Put off the old and put on the new. This is the solution. It's putting off the old belief and put on the new belief based on your true identity in Christ. And if anybody uh, needs one, if you've been in any of the other classes or you've been in uh, coffee chat, coffee talk with the ladies, this is 
a great list to go down and just read these. This is your true identity in Christ. It's not inclusive of everything in the Bible, but it's just a good quick reference list. So if you, re if you read down this and um, you read it and you again, it's like reading it yes or no. Do I feel this is true of me? Am I seated in heaven right now? Do I believe that or not? If you're trying to figure out what is my identity, this is just a quick reference form that's available to you. You can grab one during break, and those are good to have on. Because what we, when we put off something, we want to put on something. If we find something we're believing, so if we're believing that success has to be hard, and Jesus says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light, then does that say success is hard? So we put on the truth. You want to put on your true identity in Christ, what it is that God says about you. Put off the old, put on the new. When you were saved, the old man died, the new man came alive. You put on the new. You want to continue to do that. Um, the amplified version of that same verb, scripture, Ephesians 4, 22 through 24, says, Strip away your former nature. Put off and discard the old, unrenewed self, which characterized your previous manner of life and becomes corrupt through lust and desires that spring from delusion, and be constantly renewed in the spirit of your mind, having a fresh mental and spiritual attitude, and put on the new nature, the regenerated self created in God's image, God-like in true righteousness and holiness. So both versions, it's put off, put on. To transform, we've got to put off the old belief and put on the truth of who we are in Christ. Now this is different than just changing. So let's look at change versus transformation. Change is not yet. Haven't done it yet. Got to do it. Yeah, if you can't keep up with me, I'll have the chart available to you later. I did not print this out for you, but we can get it to you. Um, this is a change versus transformation chart that I've put together. But change says, not yet. Hadn't made it yet. Transformation says, it's already done. It's already finished. All we have to do is walk in who we are. Change says, I'm planning... Transformation says God's plan. You see the difference? Change comes from pressure, and that's usually behavior modification. Transformation comes from Jesus. It's God's nature does the work in us. Change is I am not and I must become. Transformation is I am because of Jesus and I'm yielding to a process. If you've sat under my teaching very long, you've heard probably about two or three things I say all the time. It's a process. You're yielding to a process. And then write it down, which is part of this class too. We do want you to journal your journey as you go through and you uh, discover beliefs that you need to change. I want you to write them down. Keep a record of it because it's going to be important to you to, to see what God's doing in your life. Change contributes to unbelief and works righteousness. Change contributes to unbelief and works righteousness. Which, you know, i got to do it myself or I can't be righteous. Transformation contributes to faith and self-worth, which is faith righteousness. We're righteous because of what Jesus did. Change takes to a place of continual effort and dead works. You're always having to work and work and work to change. Transformation takes to a place of rest. We're resting in what's already been accomplished for us. Change focuses on sin consciousness.
and transformation focuses on righteousness consciousness. So if you were raised under law, you probably were focused on sin all the time, which most of us were. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if you're thinking about sin, then what happens? You sin. <laughs> you tend to head to what you're focusing on, right? <laughs> you're going to go to hell. Yeah, <laughs> hell for you. <laughs> you probably heard that too. I did. You did, yeah. You, you better pray every night before you go to bed and repent for, uh, and repent in those terms was to turn away from everything you've ever done wrong or if you die in your sleep, you're going to hell. That's some fear. For the things that you didn't even know you did wrong. <laughs> the things you didn't know. Repent. Yeah, ask forgiveness for those things you uh, forgot you did or might have done or thought about doing. Lots and lots. Yeah, sin consciousness, not good. We want to be righteousness consciousness. Change is external. It's all these things out here that we really can't control, although we try to. Transformation is internal. If I am unhappy with a situation in my family and I'm trying to fix everybody that's out here, it's not going to happen. I can't control them. I can't fix them. I can't change them. But if I begin to, to have the, what's inside of me transformed so that I'm looking more and more like Jesus every day, then these things out here are going to begin to change because of what's inside of me and what my heart is believing is going to be uh, that frequency is going to be so strong that people are going to see the change and they're going to feel the change. So internal is transformation. Change says, I have to change. i got to do something different. Transformation says, I have to become. Change is knowledge of Jesus, but transformation is relationship with Jesus. There's a big difference. A big difference. Um, change. Here's the truth. So it's more knowledge. But transformation applies the truth. It makes a difference. Because you can hear it all day long. You can be able to quote the scriptures backwards if you want to. But if you don't <laughs> apply it, if you don't have the relationship, it's not going to do you much good. Change is becoming. Always, always, not, not yet, not yet, not quite good enough. Transformation is being, just being who you are because of what Jesus did. Change comes by adding and subtracting. Let me try this. Let me stop doing that. Transformation comes by just being because it's already been done. What was needed to be taken away was taken away. It's left in the grave. What needed to be offered to it's been offered. We just have to receive it. So then change is about math, and transformation is about miracles. And the miracles is where we want to be. And you do know that miracles aren't just a limb growing out, right? You can see miracles all the time. God's always doing things around you. Uh, we just have to learn to look for them. It can be the little things can be the check that comes in the mail when you have no money left in the bank, right? It's the little things. We, we want to think every miracle has to be huge, but anytime God does something good for us, it's a miracle, even in the little things. Okay, growth. Change says it's growth to fix ourselves. Growth to fix ourselves. <clears throat> Transformation is growth to experience limitless depths of God's love and goodness. So if you're just changing, you may change the way you dress and feel like you have fixed yourself. But true growth is experiencing the limitless depths of God's love and goodness. Change is become a new person. Transformation is allowing the true you to emerge. So change versus transformation. 
In order to transform, we have to align our hearts with what God's word says about us, and we have to believe who we are in Christ. Not just know it, but believe it. It's moving from head knowledge to heart knowledge. It's that transformation. It's really getting it from your head to your heart. It's putting off the old and putting on the new. So part of alignment is learning to be aware even of what we say our, our, and correct our speech. So I'm going to uh, say a few things here and see if you've said these before. Because these can be negative and destructive to our spirits and our bodies, and we don't even think about it. I'm dying for a hamburger. <laughs> You're right now? <laughs> right now. Or what about, stop it, you're killing me. I can't do it. I'll never be able to fill in the blank. Retire and have no debt. <laughs> Get up on the front row. <laughs> I'm going to die at work. Yes, those things. I'm so stupid. Dummy, why would I do that? I will always have pain in my back, knees, shoulders. Or I'll always be broke. I'll never have anything. I'll always be at a dead-end job. How about my boss hates me? I'd kill for a drink of water right now. (laughs) Or drink of something else. (laughs) Or I'm going to kill you if you do that again. Have we said those things? I'll beat you to death. Yes. I'm going to beat you stupid. Okay. So how many of us have said these things? We say these things and we don't realize it. I'm sure all of us, all of us have said these things or similar things that we really don't think about it. How many of you have been at a funeral and you say something about killing me or dying and you're saying it just in the course of conversation you realize they just lost a loved one and I'm saying this joking or whatever. We say these things and we don't even realize it, but we, there's so much power in our words. We have to be aware of what is coming out of our mouth, out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. And these words have power. And especially when you're saying stuff like, I'm dumb, I'm stupid, I'll never. You're really just forming stronger and stronger beliefs that are going to keep you locked into those limiting beliefs that will keep you from going into success that you want to have. Um, I um, have a relative that was told, you're stupid, you're stupid, you're stupid. And to this day, I will hear them say, I'm just stupid. That's why I can't do anything right. I'm just stupid. Because that gets in there and forms such a strong belief. And then they believe they can't do anything, so they get stuck. So be careful what we say. It's also important to realize what you're agreeing with. And we have a nurse, at least one nurse in the room. Medical diagnosis can be one of the hardest beliefs to overcome because you have had a person in authority give your pain a name or your discomfort or whatever's going on in your body just got a name. And now it's going to be harder to get rid of that. And if you're sitting in the doctor's office and you're agreeing with what they say, you're just giving that thing a right to be in your body because you are agreeing with it and you're embracing it. And it's going to be harder and harder to change that belief. Have you ever noticed that your pain gets worse when the doctor confirms that you have something? I, had a, I heard a story this couple of weekends ago about a, a relative of somebody that had like pain in their arm or something and as they went to the doctor and the doctor was, yeah, it's this, it's this. He said, I realized when I was sitting there and the doctor's diagnosing it that the pain just got worse and worse. 
because you're agreeing with it. You're focusing on that pain and agreeing with it. Have you ever heard of somebody dying quickly when they get a diagnosis? What about somebody dying from a wrong diagnosis? I heard a story about a man who got diagnosed with cancer, and like three weeks later, he's dead. Then they found out he didn't even have cancer. It was the wrong person that got the diagnosis. So how strong are our beliefs? How powerful are they? I'm taking away from this that we should avoid doctors. <laughs> <laughs> avoid doctors. Yes, you hear those words, you pick up that frequency, and, and it's been proven that every word you hear, when you hear that, you have a picture that goes with it. And so when you're talking a diagnosis, then you've pictured that part of your body being injured, damaged, whatever, and so those pictures are stronger. They say a picture's worth a thousand words. So it really is vital. I'm not saying don't go to the doctor if you need to. <laughs> but remember, you have authority to, over your body, and you have the right to tell pain to get out of your body. You have a right to um, take that authority over it and not have to go to the doctor. But even if you do go, and, and that's okay if you have to go, you can get the information you need, but don't get into agreement with it. Don't begin to call it my. It's um, my heart condition, my arthritis, my whatever. Don't begin to embrace it and agree with it. Uh, Dan Moeller tells the story of a man that was in a coma for months, and everybody had prayed over him. And finally, he went to the hospital with the wife, and the Lord just spoke to him and said, break the agreement with all the diagnosis he had had I don't know how many I want to say like 20 something diagnosis and uh, they just stood there and held hands over him if I'm remembering the story right and broke every diagnosis just we break agreement we he doesn't have he doesn't have he doesn't have and he came out of the coma because it really is just how strong it is when we agree with something there's so much power in our words that we have to be careful uh, what we're putting in our hearts and what we're agreeing with. It's got, we got to be really careful of that. So we have to realize um, what is normal? How do you, what's your normal? You may, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what? Don't ask. Yeah, you'll see and you go, I just can't wait for things to get back to normal. What is normal? Think about it. What is your normal? What are you used I to? Know what I want normal to be. You, okay, that's a good first step. I know what I want normal to be. That's where we want to head to. Because what our normal often is, is what you're used to dealing with. It's what we get used to. Our normal life is what we've become used to. It's what we're comfortable with, or even uncomfortable with, but we're okay with living in it. We're not necessarily That's willing familiar. to make the changes because it's familiar. You know what's coming, so you know how to deal with it. Uh huh. Yeah. I know what's coming. I know how to deal with this, so I'm okay with it. But if you really look at it, you're going, I don't like this. I don't want to live like this. I want to be filthy, stinking rich. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I want to have I'm plenty. I'm tired of working 12 hour shifts back to 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 back so we know what we want it to be. Yeah. So then we have to define our normal. Okay, and if, let me just throw this out there. If you think complaining helps, no. it doesn't. First. Think again. Mm -hmm. it, it only focuses on the problem. Yeah, complaining focuses on the problem. It doesn't provide a solution at all. And it actually moves the problem further from the solution. You've just moved it from the realm of being, I think I can solve it, to it's impossible to solve this. I'm just stuck here. I'm going to live with it. This is the way it's going to be. 
so complaining does not help. If you're complaining about a situation and you're not liking it, begin to bless. Begin to bless the situation. So, here's an example of a normal. A couple's married. Say the woman has a cycle of work for a while, quit for a while, work for a while, quit for a while. And the normal is the husband becomes accustomed to living and just basing everything on his income only because he knows he can't count on her keeping a job. Or he learns to get by with the least amount possible so that even if he has money, he's still going to get by on the least amount possible because he's so used to it, it becomes his normal. doesn't mean he likes it, but complaining about it doesn't change anything. So, if he's complaining to her, is that going to make it any better? Uh -uh. Chances are that's just going to make it worse. So, they get used to it. Okay, this is the way it is. This is the cycle. One of the couple's not going to keep a job, so I'm just going to get used to living in this situation. And that becomes the normal. Or, what about a person that deals with back pain every day for years? You cause yourself, that's good. Just ignore it. <laughs> ignore it. Because you've become accustomed to it. Yeah. It's become your normal. Pain is my normal. I'm going to live with it every day because it's just what I have. So then if you're dealing with it every day and you're expecting that to be your normal, then what are the chances of getting healed? Are we really expecting to ever be delivered of that pain. I prayed for somebody a few weeks ago and they've been in pain for like five years with a knee incident and, and instead of saying, or they said, I know God can heal me, but I know I just, I just have to live with this like it is and God's going to use me in spite of it. And he will, but if you believe I have to live with this, then you're going to live with it. So it's changing that belief because the truth is God left all sickness. Jesus left all sickness in the grave, right? He bore all our sickness, so you don't have to. You do not have to have that pain in your life forever. You can get rid of it. How many of you believe you function better under pressure? Eh, a few, if you can't decide. <laughs> Remember, this is going worldwide. I used to say, I work better under pressure. But we don't. Sorry to tell you. You really don't. You really don't. You just become used to it. And the truth is, you don't function any better under pressure. You just become, it becomes your norm. Pressure is what I'm used to, so I'm going to function under it. When actually, if you ever got out from under the pressure, so what happens when you go on vacation, you're on the beach for a week, and then you come back into that same job where you felt like you worked wet, better under pressure? So now there's more pressure. So then that really shows you, you really don't work better under pressure. You really do function better when you're not under pressure. So when a person lives under stress, stress constantly, you get used to it, though. Your body learns to live under that pressure, and you begin to function under that stress and think that you actually function better when the truth is you don't. Um, we talked about a person staying in an abusive relationship because it becomes the normal. It becomes what they're used to. It's, it's real life to them. And you're only comfortable living within the boundaries of who you believe yourself to be. Think about that. You're only comfortable living within the boundaries of who you believe yourself to be. So if you've been told your whole life, you can be anything you want to be. You are unlimited. Anything you set your mind to, you can accomplish. You, they're going to accomplish it. That's who they believe they are, and those are going to be successful people. So it's the same thing, though, if it's the opposite way, 